Hey, good morning. It's great to see you. Hey, if you're a guest with us, thanks so much for being here. If uh, you're joining us on the other side of a monitor, we want to say thanks for worshiping with us today. We are in the third week of a series that we're calling Ruth, and it is based on the Old Testament book. Can you guess what it's called? Ruth. Yeah. Ruth, and uh, I would just tell you, man, I am so excited about this series, so excited about the book of Ruth, because in the book of Ruth, man, I see God's love for us, and in the book of Ruth, we just find ourselves in that, and that God loves us, and it's just a foreshadowing of things that are going to come, and uh, Ruth is just really uh, fascinating. So, in the book of Ruth, uh, God, in his word, has given us uh, a collection of stories revealing who he is to us. And uh, what I would tell you is in, in the book of Ruth, we get to meet a family. And in chapter one, we see the family make some decisions that aren't in their best interest. They do what is right in their own eyes, basically meaning I'm going to do what I want to do. God, I don't need you to tell me what's best for me. I'm going to do it. And here's what I would tell you. It doesn't turn out well for them. And it rarely, in fact, it never turns out good for us either in the long run. And we see in chapter two, we see, or in chapter one, we see this family trying to make its way back from a bad decision. And in chapter two, we see hope. Well, today is like it has all been building towards chapter three. Like in chapter three today, what we're going to read, the story of Ruth has been building towards this moment. Like if Ruth was a movie, we would meet a family in the opening scenes and the, opening, the family would make some bad choices and then they would begin climbing their way back. And in the movie, it's all pointing towards this one moment. And so all to say, man, what happens in chapter three where we're gonna be today is very exciting, it's very thrilling, it's been building up to this point. But before we even go there, did you hear what I just said? Group of people doing what was right in their own eyes apart from God. And yet God looks down on this family and he says, I can use that. I can use that, that people would know how good I am. And he uses it. So here's what I'm telling you. This morning, if you feel like your life is more of a series of broken roads in wrong turns. God loves you. And God can use your life to point people to his goodness. And that's good news for all of us. In fact, you could say the book of Ruth is like a foreshadowing of good news before Jesus. All right, so that being said, hey, let's go ahead and let's turn to the book of Ruth and let's just dive into chapter three. Let's see what's going to happen. Uh, what I would tell you is if I was going to sum up this, uh, this week, chapter three, I would just call it a new direction. There's going to be a new direction for Ruth. And if you're looking for the address of Ruth in your Bible, she's found in the Old Testament. And it would go something like this. Starting at the beginning, you find Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. There's her address, so you can find it there. Or if you have your Bible on your phone, click a button, man. Feels good, dude. You're there. If you've got your Bible, turn a page. That feels good, too. You can highlight and underline in there. All right, Ruth chapter 3. And uh, let's just kind of start, um, before we get into chapter 3, I'm going to start with the last verse in chapter 2. We left Ruth. She was staying in a field. She stayed close to the servant girls of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvest were finished. And she lived there with her mother-in-law. So she's just every day going up, getting up, going to the fields of Boaz. All right. So that's what's going on in Ruth's life and Naomi's life. Well, one day, her mother-in-law said to Ruth, hey, my daughter, should I not try to find a home for you where you will be well provided for? This is where chapter 3 intersects with chapter 1 because if you look in chapter 1, Naomi's always wanted to care for Ruth. She's always had Ruth's best interest in mind. She's just never had a way to provide for it now. But now something new is coming, a new direction. So here we go. So, hey, uh, my daughter, should I try not try to find a home for you where you will be well provided for? Then she brings up, is not Boaz with whose servant girls you have been? Is he not a kinsman redeemer of ours? Tonight he's going to be winnow uh, winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Ruth, go and wash and perfume yourself, put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor. 
But don't let him know that you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying and then go uncover his feet and lie down. And I would just say, Ruth, don't get that wrong because if you show up anywhere other than Boaz, it's going to freak him out more than Boaz. Anyway, that's what my translation reads. (laughs) He will tell you then what you're supposed to do. I'll do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything that her mother Naomi her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking, he was in good spirits. Yes, the Bible said that. And he went over to lie down on the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, under, under, uncovered his feet, and she lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. And he turned and discovered there was a woman lying at his feet. And he responded the only way any other man would respond as well. Who are you? A.K.A., what are you doing here? And she just responds, I'm your servant, Ruth. She said, spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a kinsman redeemer. I'm just going to stop here for a minute because if you look at this story through the Western context, you've got a woman who's putting on her best clothes, putting on her best perfume. She's going to see a guy at night and she's saying, spread your cloak over me. In our culture, that is very forward. That has got like some sexual undertones to it in our culture. So if you're thinking that, one, you're not weird. But let me just kind of correct our thinking. There is nothing sexual about what's going on here. Ruth isn't there for that. She's there for life change. And I'll explain that as we go through the morning. Just understand as you read that, if you're thinking, whoa, this is racy. Well, there's parts of the Bible that are racy, but this just isn't one of those parts. Okay. All right, so then after that happens, after she says, please spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a kinsman redeemer, the Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you have showed earlier to Naomi. You have not run after younger men, whether rich or poor. Now, my daughter, don't be afraid, for I will do for you all that you... That is a really big deal. All my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of noble character, Ruth. Although it is true that I am near of kin, there is a kinsman redeemer nearer than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if this man wants to redeem, good, let him redeem. But if he's not willing to, as surely as the Lord lives, then I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at Boaz's feet until morning, got up before anybody could be recognized, and then he says to Ruth, Don't let it be known that a woman came here. Ruth, don't tell anybody that you've been here. He also said, please bring me your shawl. You're wearing, and and then hold it out. When she held out her shawl, he poured into it six measures of barley and put it on her, and then he went back into town. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, how did it go? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her. Picture jumping, squealing, screaming, giggling, smiling, celebrating, high five, hugging. It was awesome. Again, that's what my translation says. And then she added, he gave me these six measures of barley saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty handed. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens. For the man is not going to rest until the matter is settled today. Chapter 3. So, in chapter 3, we see this phrase again. We've, we, chapter 2, we met Boaz, but they attached a title to Boaz. It was called the kinsman redeemer. Like, we use that word a lot, don't we? And then in chapter 3, there's like kinsman redeemer. And if you didn't go to Bible school or if nobody has ever told you what a kinsman redeemer is, let me tell you what a kinsman redeemer is. It is a family relative who bears the responsibility of carrying on the family name. Now, here's what would happen. In ancient ancient history, in the ancient culture for Jewish people, it was customary that if you had a family and you had sons and everybody got married, well, if your brother died and he was married and he had kids, it would be the next brother in line's responsibility to take care of his family. 
you, what you would do is you would marry your brother's wife. And his kids would now become your kids. His wife would be your kids. And that's where you get the kin part. But you also have the redeemer part. That redeemer thing, that redeemer word is a big word because get this, if you don't redeem, if you don't, if you're not the kinsman redeemer, if you don't follow through, then your brother's name is as good as dead. It will be blotted out from history. But by redeeming it, you are taking something that was dead and bringing it back to life. Wow, does that sound like God to me? Wow, does that sound like Jesus to me? Not taking good people and making them better, taking people who were dead in their sins and bringing them to life. Wow. Dude, Ruth is an awesome, awesome book because get this. God takes a group of people and through their circumstances, he works through their life to reveal to the world that he loves all people and he's doing it during a time in history where he is just God of the Hebrew people. But through the story of Ruth, he is proving that his love is for all people because we see that he is working for the good of a Gentile. And that basically means if you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile. And God is working for the good of all people. Ruth is evidence of all people. Like he is actually working for her good and she's going to praise him for that. Now, her life is over. Unless it can be redeemed. And here comes Boaz, who is a kinsman redeemer of Naomi's. And if Boaz redeems her, he would be redeeming a Gentile, a picture of all people. Where else have we seen that done in history? Jesus Christ, redeeming all of us. So when we look at the book of Ruth that was written 1300, or approximately 1,300 years before Jesus, Boaz is symbolic of God's love through Jesus Christ. When you look at Boaz's life, he is symbolic because he is going to be a redeemer, which is what Jesus has done for us. We have no life. He's redeemed us. And you get that 1,300 years before Jesus Book of Ruth is absolutely amazing. So what on earth is a kinsman redeemer? Is somebody whose job, it's a family member who's close to kin, is your job to redeem your brother in your family's name. And there are three requirements of every kinsman redeemer. The first one is you have to have the right to be a kinsman redeemer, meaning you have to be the next in line. You have to have the right to be able to do it, which means you've got to be in the right order in order to redeem. The second uh, requirement of every kinsman redeemer is you have to have the resources to redeem. Because chances are you already had a family. You had a wife. You had kids. Do you know that this custom, if it was still in place, would absolutely terrify my brother? Because I have two boys. And a kinsman redeemer has got to have the resources to take on the responsibility. I have two boys who can eat me out of house and home. I thank God for Sam's Club. Okay, it is made a way to buy in bulk. I can feed these jokers. I can feed these raptors that live in my house. But to be a redeemer, you're already taking care of the raptors in your home, and now you're inviting other ones in your home. And oh, by the way, you've already built a home for your family that is perfect for your family, but now by taking on his family, you've got to do a serious renovation to make room for. Which just goes back to the point, not even if you had the right, didn't mean you could do it, you also had to have the resources to do it. But probably the biggest one in all of this is you had to have the resolve. Because you're not just inviting them to stay for the weekend. And isn't it great to have family for the weekend? Actually, it's great to have them all the time. But you had to have the resolve because now you're saying you're not a guest. You're my family. Doesn't that sound like what God offers us? 
through Jesus, adopting us into his family. Oh, I told you, Ruth is really good. So those are the three requirements of every kinsman redeemer. So now let's kind of just get into the story and look at it. So Ruth, so Ruth chapter 3 starts with Naomi, again, just thinking about the well-being and the welfare of, of Ruth. Naomi knows she's up there in years, and she's always had a heart's desire to take care of Ruth. But man, in chapter 1 and 2, she just never really had the ability to. But now that we've gone through some life, now that we've gone through, through some hard times, now that things have settled down, she remembers. I have a kinsman redeemer, and it is his right to redeem my family. Hey, Ruth, I've got this idea. You need to go get your pretty on. You need to put on your best dress. You need to put your smell good on. You need to look good. And hey, here's where Boaz is going to be. And just go say hi. Again, if you look at that through our Western eyes, it would just look like they're plotting, like they're conniving, like they're scheming. Again, culture, viewpoint is everything. They're not plotting anything. They're taking advantage of a door that God has opened for them. There is nothing conniving about this. They're just saying, hey, here's a direction we can take, a direction that will provide a future. Wow, we have a new direction, Ruth. Let's go for it. So she says, get your smell good on, get your pretty on, go to Boaz. And this isn't the main point of the story, but it is a narrative I want to talk about for just a second because it's so important. Ruth, or Naomi tells Ruth, look good as you can, smell as good as you can, and then go to the one who can change your life. And in that tiny piece, I see us. Because there are three ways that we can approach God. Two of them are the wrong way. The first one is, we think that we gotta get cleaned up and look good and smell good and present ourselves in hopes that God would accept us. We do it all the time. People are like, hey, you know what? I, man, I, I, I want God to accept me, so I'm not going to swear anymore. And that's worked good for you for the last 30 seconds. And then we say, God, hey, I, I didn't lose my temper this morning. I look good, God. I look good. And we... We come to him trying to be on equal footing with him. We can't. He's God. We're not. We will never look good enough. And so this morning, I know that there's people who have come in here today, and maybe you're feeling like, hey, I've got to act a certain way. I've got to talk a certain way. I've got to behave a certain way in order for God to accept me. And what I would tell you is you're wearing yourself out. You're psyching yourself out. That is a way that we do not approach God. Let me tell you another way that we deal with God is the enemy tries to create distance. If you feel distant from God this morning, that's sin talking. That's the enemy talking. You see, God came that we could be in relationship with him. But sometimes there is distance between us because of our actions. And if there's distance between you and God this morning... That is not of God. That's of the enemy. The enemy loves to put distance between us and him, and here's what it sounds like. God would never love you. Do you remember when you did that? God's forgiven a lot, but there's no way he can forgive that. There's no way he'll forgive you, and that is just a lie. Look at what Ruth does. Ruth gets her pretty on, but then she goes to Boaz. She goes to her kinsman redeemer, and she doesn't hide the fact she's a slave. And that's the big part of the story. That's the part on your outline I want you to walk away with. Are you ready for this? We get to come to God as we are. We can bring our brokenness. We can bring our faults. We can bring our shortcomings. And we get to go to him. Can you believe this? 
That there is one who is able to tr- change us, to transform us, to offer us life, wait, to adopt us into his family, a family that will last forever, and we just get to come to him as we are. We don't have to do the work of getting prettied up or smell good on. We can just bring it all, and he'll accept us. Wow. That is freeing for all of us in here but I'm sure that there are some that are feeling that on an absolutely epic level. Ruth just went to Boaz. And did you notice, you see, we come to God, either we try to look good or there's some separation, but the correct way to come to God is as we are. Whatever baggage you got, drop it. Whatever stuff you're dragging, set it down. Because we get to come to Jesus as we are. But did you notice how Ruth came to Jesus? Where did she where did she lay down? At his feet. Did you know that that is a place reserved for a slave? At the master's feet. She came to Boaz completely humble. And she didn't come to Boaz saying, "Hey man, I love how you let me work in the fields. Can we just keep doing that? She didn't come in saying, Boaz, I love how you've taken care of me. Can we do that? She came with an audacious, with a bold ask. And she said, will you cover me with your garment and redeem my life? Do you know what she was saying in that moment? Boaz, Will you marry me? Which means, can I be a part of your family? Will you redeem my life? Can my life go forward from here? Because if he doesn't say yes, right there. And get this. Get this. Slaves have a greater right than she does. She's a Moabitess. She's a Gentile. She's not even a Jewish slave. She's going under the cover of darkness because she can't go in the day. And she's asking Boaz this. This is scandalous. She's got no right. She's got no standing. And she asks him anyway. And here's what the part I love about this. This is the part that drives that could drive me to tears. I don't want to cry. You guys... This is how we get to come to God with absolutely nothing, with no standing, with no guarantees of absolutely anything. And do you know what Jesus says to us? Yes, I will do for you as you all, I'll do for you all that you ask. I will adopt you into my family. You get to be a part of my kingdom that has no end. Yeah, I get it. You don't even have the standing of a slave. There's nothing good, and I'll take all of it, and I'll redeem it, and that's just really good news for you and me. It was awesome news for Ruth. It's the reason she went home all giddy, high five, and like, woo. And if you want to know how we should approach God, follow Ruth's example. Last week, do you remember Boaz invited her to stay in the field and she said, man, I can't believe you would let me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now look at her. With the position of a slave, you know what she says? I need you, I need you, I need you. Boaz, I'm not trying to add you to my life. I'm asking to be an heir in your family. And he says, yes. Wow. That's awesome. And in that, when he says, I will do for you all that you ask, we see something that is really big. And here it is. It's the second blank on your, it's the next blank on your outline. God cares about the heart of man not the appearance of man. He cares about the character. He cares about the inside, not the appearance. And this is a big deal for us because in our culture and in our society, what matters most? Image. It's why you drive the car you drive. 
It's why you live where you live. It's why you got the clothes that you've got. It's why you tell the stories you tell. Why? Because image is king in this culture. But what we see is, did you notice what Boaz didn't say to Ruth? I find that absolutely fascinating. He didn't wake up and be like, whoa, you smell amazing. Where did you get that? Because you smell that good, I want to be around that for the rest of my life. I will do for you all that you ask. He never said that. You know what else he didn't say? Wow, Ruth, you are looking good. And because you look like that and what other people are going to think about me, count me and I'll do all that you ask. Did you notice he never said that? Instead, he said something like, wow, what you have done, this kindness that you've shown is greater than what you've done in the first. Because of that, I will do for you all that you have asked. You see, there was something about, and you cannot escape this in the story of Ruth, there was something about her. It was her character. It was her heart. Evidenced by what she did publicly, which was humble herself. See, God loves humility. If you want to know how to approach God, we do it with humility. We don't do it with like, hey, Lord, look at how good I did today. That's probably why you love me more than you love, well, you know, this person over here. She just came like, Lord, I don't deserve this. If you want to know how to approach God, we do it with humility. And what Boaz is, what God is telling us through Boaz's reaction to Ruth is that he cares about the heart, your heart. He cares about what's in here more than he cares about what everybody else sees. But for us in our culture, we care about what everybody thinks. We care about what everybody sees. Is why we smile. Is why we do all this stuff. Because it matters to us what other people think. What God is telling us through the story of Ruth is we ought to care what he thinks. And he cares deeply about your heart. And because he cares deeply about your heart. And because I care deeply about your life. Because I pray for you. Because I love you. Because God loves you. Let me tell you how to work on your heart. Second Peter Chapter 3, verses 1 through 11, where Peter says, Brothers and sisters, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. And to goodness, we forgot already. <laughs> it's okay. Knowledge. And to knowledge, self control. And to self control, perseverance. And to perseverance, Perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and a mutual affection, love. Did you notice that that list that Peter asked us to add to has nothing to do with this? And it has everything to do with this. But if we'll add to, if we'll work on, then what God does in here will be something that everybody out here can see. And who gets the credit for that? God. God cares about your heart, and because I care about you, and because God cares about you, what I would say is, church, friends, brothers and sisters, as hard as you work at getting ready, putting your feel good, smell good, look good on, this is what matters. Work harder at that. Go after this with more work, because, be, because, do you remember what Paul said in Corinthians? You've been to weddings, so you've heard it said, you know, the whole, the whole idea about love? Like love is patient. Love is kind. Do you know how that chapter starts? He said, if you had the wisdom or if you had the faith that would move mountains, but you did not love, you would have nothing. If you could preach Mike Fackler with eloquence, if you could share, brothers and sisters, with eloquence, the love and the nature of God, but you possessed love, you didn't possess that yourself, you would have nothing. You could give everything you had to the poor and be burned at the stake as a martyr. But if we don't love, we gain nothing. Do you know what that tells me? That God cares a whole lot more about this than he cares about this. And 20 years ago, I might have looked in the mirror and said, you look good today. But if something happens, they got to cut the gray out of my hair now. And I can't stop it. 
And I can't stop the wrinkles that are going here. But I can be as young forever in here. And I can be more attractive than I've ever been in here. In the only eyes of the one who matters, which is God. And he tells us, this is what matters most to me. That's a big lesson for us. That is a big, big lesson for us that we should be working on that whole thing. And so, um, all right. Uh, so he, Boaz says, hey, I'm going to go and do all that you ask because of that. And then here's what I find striking, and, uh, and I'll close with this. Is that uh, he says, hey, Ruth, come here. Take off your shawl. Okay, just be like a head, head ornament here for her. Take that off and bring it here. And she holds it out to him. And he puts six measures of barley in there. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you. Anytime the Bible gives you a number, it's because that number matters. It is a number of significance. So what is up with the number, what was it again? Six. Here's why that number is such a big deal. Here's what God's telling us. Six is the number of man. It's the number that has been assigned to man. The number six. What day was man created on, do you think? The sixth day. How many days did God tell, tell Adam and Eve and man that they should work? Six days. But then God did something on the seventh. What did he do? And he told us that we should do something on day number seven. He told us we should rest. But that rest was only available because God made it so, right? So Boaz pours six measures of barley into Ruth's shaw. And what he's telling her is, your days of working are over. Tomorrow, you get to rest. And where will rest be found? In a relationship with her kinsman redeemer. And Boaz, what is God telling us through six measures of barley in the story of Ruth? That rest is available to each and every one of us through our kinsman redeemer, Jesus. And what does rest sound like? Peace. Being at peace with God. And if we can be at peace with God, we can be at peace with ourselves and with our brothers and sisters. How do we have that? Our kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ. Boaz is just saying, hey, Ruth, rest is coming. But through the story of Ruth and Naomi, God is saying, rest is coming for all of us in the form of Jesus Christ, that we can be at peace with God and man. And, oh, what is the Christmas story? Didn't we read it earlier? What is part of the joy of Christmas? Peace. That is God's ultimate mic drop. In Ruth, Ruth gets to experience peace. You and I can experience peace through Jesus Christ. And then I'll just, I'll, I'll just uh, tell you this. Boaz says, don't go home empty-handed. And I'll try to put this out on Facebook to really uh, explore the depths of it because we don't have time today. But when Boaz gave that barley to Ruth, it was part of a wedding proposal. It wasn't just a gift. Like he is making his intentions known to, to Ruth and to Naomi, because in ancient custom, a father of a son would go and select his bride. And in doing so, he would bring a gift with him for a father of the bride. Well, Ruth, her father might be in Moab, if he's even alive. But Naomi has now assumed responsibility, so she's in that role. So Boaz is sending that barley home as a gift, letting his intentions known to Naomi I plan on doing all that you have asked, which is why they're so giddy. But we're just left with a cliffhanger. It's like come back next week and see what happens. Like because we don't know. He just said I'll do it, but he hasn't done it. And it's like watching a movie where you're like, oh, it's coming, it's coming. Oh, and then it ends and you've got to wait a full week. Well, you're going to have to wait a full week. But here's what you don't have to wait a full week for. Some of you this morning are in need of a new direction because you've been living your life a certain way and it hasn't been adding up to what you thought it would. It's left you emptier than more complete and full. And so here's what I would tell you. You need a new direction. 
And so today, what you get to do is you get to come to God as you are. You get to come to Jesus as you are. And if you do that humbly, he says, you can be a part of my family. But you see, we're not asking him to just change our circumstances. We're asking him to change our lives. And for you to do that would be a new direction for you. But if you would choose Jesus as your direction, he will lead you to new life. And what I would say is do not leave. If you know that you need a new direction, if you understand what happened, if you understand what it means, if you understand that we get to come to Jesus as we are and he'll accept us, he'll forgive us, invite us into his family, do not leave today without joining his family. Don't do it. There is no time like the present, and I would just say God has presented you with an opportunity today to join his family, and we would all be wise to step into that because he loves you that much. How do I step into it? You do the same thing Ruth did. You come to him as you are in the privacy of your own seat. Just say, God, I need you not to just fix this, but to fix this, to heal this, to give this life. And he will do so. But if you notice in the story, Ruth didn't just say, oh, sweet Boaz, hey, I'll see you later. She went with the full intention of staying. So if you have that conversation with God, do so with the full intention of saying, I will follow you because he leads to life. Lord God, I want to say thank you for how much you loved us. I want to say thank you, God, for thinking of us even then. Lord, as all of Casper gathers this morning, you look down from your heavenly throne and you see each and every soul, not only in this little piece of the kingdom known as Casper, but all around the world, and we all matter equally to you. But for my brothers and sisters who are here, I pray that they would know and I pray that they would step in and I pray that they would understand the depth of your grace, your mercy, and your love. God, I pray that you would redeem those who need to be redeemed today. And God, for all people who have been redeemed, we just stop and we say thank you. And I pray that the work that you're doing on the inside would be evidence that people, when they see us, they would see you. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.